Envision this. You're working at a psychiatry clinic and you're seeing a 31-year-old male that states that he is here for counseling. The patient goes on to report that he suffers from a fear of heights and he is here to continue his ongoing therapy to help with this phobia. You begin the session by showing him photos of cliffs and tall buildings. Your patient appears very agitated and says, These photos make me feel really uncomfortable, like physically nervous. You encourage him to take some deep, relaxing breaths while continuing to study photos of elevated areas. Eventually, he begins to feel more at ease. What type of conditioning is this? Welcome to Audio Bricks. This is Ed Barnes breaking down the principles of learning in your ears. After completing this section, you will be able to 1. Describe the three major theories of learning. 2. Define classical conditioning and its components. 3. Define operant conditioning and its components. 4. Compare and contrast classical and operant conditioning. And 5. Describe social learning theory. So, how do we learn? Learning is traditionally defined as acquiring knowledge through study, experience, or being taught. In psychology, it is often defined as a relatively lasting change in behavior that results from experience. Learning is an ongoing process, and we continue learning throughout our entire lives. During the 20th century, three major theories of learning emerged. One is classical conditioning, which is learning through association. Two is operant conditioning, which is learning through reinforcement or punishment. And three, social learning, which is learning through observation. Part one. What is classical conditioning? Let's start with some important definitions in psychology. Behavior is defined as an organism's reaction to its environment. A target behavior is an observable behavior that has been selected for change. Behavioral psychology, also known as behaviorism, is based on the idea that behaviors are acquired through conditioning, which occurs through our interactions with the environment. Behaviorism originated with psychologist John Watson in 1913. From the 1920s to the 1950s, it became the dominant school of thought in psychology. Classical conditioning is learning that occurs when a reflexive response elicited by an unconditioned stimulus can be evoked by a second conditioned stimulus. So what is an unconditioned stimulus? It is something that naturally triggers a certain response without any prior learning. It results in an unconditioned response, or the reflexive response. Now, what is a conditioned stimulus? It is a previously neutral stimulus that becomes associated with the unconditioned stimulus to eventually produce the reflexive response. When that happens, the reflexive response is known as the conditioned response. Let's talk examples now. Russian psychologist Ivan Pavlov discovered this type of learning in 1902 when researching the physiology of digestion in dogs. Pavlov observed that dogs naturally salivate in response to food. He noticed that they also salivated when they saw the lab assistant's white coat, and he thought that this response to a different stimulus was interesting. In his experiments, he paired the unconditioned stimulus, or the sight and smell of food, that elicited the uncontrolled response of salivation with the sound of a bell, as the conditioned stimulus. After multiple trials, the dogs would salivate in response to the sound of the bell alone. So for review, in this example, the unconditioned stimulus is the food, and the unconditioned response is salivation. But after the conditioning takes place, salivation also becomes the conditioned response to the sound of the bell, which is the conditioned stimulus. In classical conditioning, the term extinction is used when the conditioned stimulus is applied repeatedly without being paired with the unconditioned stimulus. Over time, the learned behavior occurs less often and eventually stops altogether. Let's pause for a quick quiz. 
In Pavlov's experiment, what was the conditioned stimulus? The conditioned stimulus in Pavlov's experiment was the bell that was able to trigger salivation in the dogs, even though no food was present. Part 2. What is operant conditioning? Operant conditioning is learning that occurs through associations between a behavior and a resulting reward or punishment. This theory originated with psychologist B.F. Skinner in the late 1950s who held that actions followed by reinforcement will be strengthened and those followed by punishment or an undesirable outcome will be weakened. Let's talk examples again. The concepts of positive and negative reinforcement are based on the premise that rewards increase behaviors and punishments decrease behaviors. Positive reinforcement occurs when a desired reward and applied stimulus increases the likelihood of a behavior. An example is a mouse pressing a button to receive food. The stimulus or reward is the food, and pushing the button is the behavior that is increased when food is given. Negative reinforcement occurs when removal of an aversive stimulus increases the likelihood of behavior. For example, the mouse presses a button to avoid being shocked. Removing the stimulus, the shock, elicits the behavior of button pressing. On the other hand, punishment decreases the likelihood of a behavior. Adding a punishing, unpleasant stimulus, positive punishment, should decrease the behavior. For example, shocking a mouse when it bites the cage should decrease the biting behavior. Negative punishment occurs when something desirable is taken away. For example, if every time the mouse bites the cage, its food is taken away. This should also decrease the biting behavior. It's important to note that what serves as reinforcement and punishment for an individual is specific to that individual. For instance, some children may respond to chocolate as a reward for good behavior, while others would prefer a later bedtime. Also, remember that reinforcements and punishments are not permanent their perceived value can fluctuate. How about another quiz? Which type of reinforcement takes place when an added stimulus increases the likelihood of a behavior? Positive reinforcement occurs when an added stimulus increases the likelihood of a behavior. One of the simplest ways to remember the difference between classical and operant conditioning is to focus on whether the behavior is involuntary or voluntary. Classical condition involves associating an involuntary response and a stimulus. Operant conditioning involves associating a voluntary behavior and a consequence. Classical conditioning is purely passive learning, while operant condition requires active learning that leads to a reward or a punishment. The influence of classical conditioning can be seen in responses such as phobias, disgust, nausea, anger, and sexual arousal. A familiar example is conditioned nausea, in which the sight or smell of a particular food causes nausea and food aversion due to a past stomach upset. Similarly, a person who has been trapped in an elevator may subsequently develop a fear of elevators and other enclosed spaces. In operant conditioning, the learner can be rewarded with incentives. A student will continue to do their homework because they know they will be rewarded with TV time when they complete their assignments. This is an example of positive reinforcement. In reality, classical and operant conditioning can work in tandem, and more than one consequence, in the case of operant conditioning, may be at play. Here's another quiz. In classical conditioning, Is the stimulus associated with a voluntary or involuntary response? In classical conditioning, the stimulus is associated with an involuntary response. Part 3. What is social learning theory? Social learning theory originated with psychologist Albert Bandura in the 1970s. In 1986, he modified his original theory and renamed it social cognitive theory. 
Social learning theory supports the behaviorist learning theories of classical conditioning from Watson and operant conditioning from Skinner with the addition of two major points. The first point is mediating processes occur between stimuli and responses. The second point, behavior is learned from the environment through the processes of observational learning. Social learning theory proposes that new behaviors can be acquired by observing and imitating others. This theory emphasizes the importance of observing and modeling the behaviors, attitudes, and emotional reactions to other people. Models include parents, relatives, friends, and teachers, and also celebrities. We are most likely to imitate people perceived as being similar to ourselves. Behavioral reinforcement can be positive or negative, as previously discussed, or external or internal. If a child wants approval from parents or peers, their approval is an external reinforcement. Feeling happy about receiving approval is an internal reinforcement. It is also possible to learn via vicarious reinforcement by observing the consequences of the actions of other people. Let's stop for a quiz. What is vicarious reinforcement? Vicarious reinforcement is a form of learning that occurs by observing the consequences of the actions of other people. And that brings us to the end of our discussion on principles of learning. Now, let's recap to see if we've completed our goals. First, can you name the three major theories of learning discussed in this brick? The three major theories are classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and social learning theory. Second, can you define classical conditioning and its components? Remember Pavlov and his dogs? The unconditioned stimulus was the food, and the unconditioned response was the dog's elevation. The sound of the bell was the conditioned stimulus that by the end of the study produced the conditioned response of dog's elevation. Third, can you define operant conditioning and its components? This time, can you remember Skinner and positive or negative reinforcement? You can increase or decrease behaviors with a positive stimulus or a negative stimulus. Fourth, can you compare and contrast classical and operant conditioning? Remember, Classical conditioning involves associating an involuntary response in the stimulus, and operant conditioning involves associating a voluntary behavior and a consequence. Also, classical conditioning is purely passive learning, while operant conditioning requires active learning that leads to a reward or punishment. Fifth, and finally, can you describe social learning theory? Social learning theory proposes that new behaviors can be acquired by observing and imitating others. This theory emphasizes the importance of observing and modeling the behaviors, attitudes, and emotional responses of others. And that's it. Armed with your newfound knowledge on learning, let's get back to the patient from the beginning of this episode. You are seeing a patient that has a fear of heights. You observe his anxious response when he is shown photos of cliffs and tall buildings, but you continue with the photos. What type of conditioning are you using to help your patient's fear of heights? You are using classical conditioning, where the unconditioned stimulus is heights, the unconditioned response is fear. The conditioned stimulus is the exposure to photos of cliffs and tall buildings, and the ultimate goal is a reflexive response that does not include fear, also known as extinction. After your session is over, you give your patient exercises to practice on his own. 
to continue to train himself to control his feelings about heights. A few months later, your patient returns for a follow-up appointment, and he proudly proclaims that he visited an observation deck at a skyscraper last week. He tells you, I didn't feel uncomfortable or nervous at all. Well, maybe a little. And that's it for our show. Make sure to like and subscribe if you like what you hear. And remember, your feedback helps us improve. You can enjoy the full Brick experience online at www.usmle-rx.com complete with illustrations, questions, flashcards, and active learning. So go check that out if you haven't already. Until next time.